Well, good evening. Happy Sabbath. And uh, we're going to begin our study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we're so grateful to be able to be here um, and to be welcoming in the Sabbath with a Bible study. We are thankful for each person that participates, um, whether they watch it afterwards or whether they're live. We're thankful, Lord, for the desire to know what is true. And we ask, Lord, that you can teach us, that you can direct our, our hearts and our minds, that you can help us in our personal walk with you to study, to seek your face. We pray, Lord, that as we open up your word to look at the messages of your prophets regarding faith, regarding the work of the Holy Spirit, regarding uh, the three-step testing prophetic message that is the everlasting gospel, that um, you can guide and direct us in this presentation and in our discussion. You know the needs that we have, the very real uh, we live in a world of sin and suffering, and all around us are things that are meant to discourage and rob away this precious gift. So again, we ask for your Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us into all truth. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening. Now, um, I am going to go to uh, uh, the study that was done by Leona um, at a certain point, whether we're going to get there today or not, I'm not certain. But as I was thinking about um, righteousness by faith, there's a scripture that uh, Jeff had, especially early on when he started to understand the three steps of the everlasting gospel and it's this passage here in John um, uh, chapter 16 regarding the comforter so Jesus says but I tell you the truth it is better for you that I go away for if I may not go away the comforter will not come unto you and if I go on I will send him unto you and having come he will convict the world concerning, and I'm reading a different translation. I'm wondering, why is this weird? Here, I'm going to go to the King James. That was Young's literal translation. I'm thinking, this doesn't sound right. Okay, I'll read this again. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove. Now, he, um, Young's had convinced. Or convict um, is that word reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment so here we have the three steps and what Jeff had done is line these up with the first second and third angels messages now Jesus goes on he says of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged and Ellen White adds when she quotes this and now shall he be cast out um, and I can find that if you want if I got the wording correct So she says, where is this here? Yeah, so this is in Desire of Ages. And, um, and I want to read this passage. So this is quite important. Um, so I'm going to switch screens here. 
Now there is a context in which he uses this statement that I think is is very very important. It's one of my favorite spirit of prophecy statements, and we're going to go through this and try to understand what why Ellen White is saying what she's saying. And um, this is page six seventy eight. It's the last starts in the last paragraph on page six seventy eight of Desire of Ages. Sister White says, as the world's redeemer, Christ was constantly confronted with apparent failure. He, the messenger of mercy to our world, seemed to do little of the work he longed to do in uplifting and saving. Satanic influences were constantly working to oppose his way, but he would not be discouraged. Through the prophecy of Isaiah, he declares, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. It is to Christ that the promise is given. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, thus saith the Lord, I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth, to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them, for he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Now we're going to read more of this uh, section here. But one of the things that's notable here, and, and this is in the context of righteousness by faith, so that's what this series is on, this everlasting um, gospel, the three-step testing prophetic message. And the idea that Christ was constantly confronted with apparent failure what is it that, why is it that Christ is confronted with apparent failure? I mean, Christ is not failing. What's the reason Ellen White gives that he's constantly confronted with apparent failure? What is his role? He was to give this final message to his generation and the message did not seem to be affecting very many hearts okay right so he's the world's redeemer right so as the world's redeemer christ seems to be impotent in actually from his perspective right because it's apparent it's apparently he's fail failing in his mission correct Agreed. He's not, but from appearances, he is. He's constantly confronted with this. One of the things that, um, Ellen White brings out about Christ is that he felt as a sinner. And he didn't just feel as a sinner when he was on the cross. And, and this is a hard thing sometimes for Adventists to understand, because when Christ took upon himself human nature, it, I mean, he, it did, he did have the possibility of sinning, but that's not all. He felt all the things that you and I feel. And the way that I look at it is that when Christ was a child, I mean, he had no sin. He had no knowledge of sin. He never sinned. But he witnessed sin. And, and I remember when I was a child, when I witnessed something that was sinful or wrong, I felt the guilt as if I had actually done the thing myself. I don't know if anybody has experienced that. I, I always did as a child, whether it was on TV or even in real life. Uh, things that were bad, I would feel guilty even witnessing those things. Now, of course, as I got older, my conscience became more seared because we see all kinds of evil all the time. 
but as a child is much more sensitive to that. Has anybody had that experience? Even as an adult, I have had it, but um, you understand what I'm talking about? Anybody? Yes. Okay. So Christ felt guilt even when he didn't sin. Just being in a world of sin because he was had a conscience, a sensitive conscience, because he was Christ, seeing sin would have been even more offensive and created more guilt in him than it would in us. Because he's, he's closer to God, right? And the closer we come to Christ, the more sin appears more sinful, right? So, so this aspect of, of Christ in, in being constantly confronted with apparent failure comes from the fact that he is the world's redeemer, come to do a work, and he seems to do little of this work that he longed to do in uplifting and saving. Now, there's satanic influences that were constantly working to oppose his way, now, unlike us, he was not discouraged. We often do get discouraged, but Christ wasn't. That is, he could understand from the scriptures, he could claim those promises and speak these words of faith because he spoke them in the book of Isaiah. Right? So all these things in the book of Isaiah that Ellen White quotes, Isaiah 49, 4, 5, 7 to 10, she says, upon this word, Jesus rested. So Jesus is exercising righteousness by faith. He sees himself apparently as a sinner, but he claims the promises of God, the very words that came from him, though he has no memory of this. But upon this word, Jesus rested, and he gave Satan no advantage. Now this is in the chapter, uh, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. So that's the context in which Ellen White writes this. When the last steps of Christ's humiliation were to be taken, when the deepest sorrow was closing about his soul, he said to his disciples, The prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The prince of this world is judged, now shall he be cast out. So this is the verse where we started from, where she talks about the prince of the world is judged. That's where it talks about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin because they believe not on me. Righteousness because I go to my father and judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So she's going to take this and then add this part. Now shall he be cast out. So this is referring to the third step in salvation, the judgment. We have uh, righteousness and judgment. And, and so we'll see how Christ is acting out in these scenes here of the last part of his humiliation, just before the last steps of his humiliation, how he is acting out righteousness by faith. She then says, with prophetic eye, Christ traced the scenes to take place in his last great conflict. He knew that when he should exclaim, it is finished, all heaven would triumph. His ear caught the distant music and the shouts of victory in the heavenly courts. He knew that the knell of Satan's empire would then be sounded, and the name of Christ would be heralded from world to world throughout the universe. So Christ now is exercising this faith because he understands the prophecies. He has this prophetic eye, and he can already hear the victory. Now we know that Christ is going, going to go through a very trying time at the cross, when the weight of the sins of the whole world are pressed upon him and he feels that complete separation from God, saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And of course, we know as Seventh-day Adventists, this is not some play act. It's real. <clears throat> and then Ellen White shifts to the followers of Christ, which is really where the Christ work is centered, because this is not about Christ. He is doing this because of us. She says, Christ rejoiced that he could do more for his followers than they could ask or think. 
He spoke with assurance, knowing that an almighty decree had been given before the world was made. He knew that truth, armed with the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit, would conquer in the contest with evil, and that the blood-stained banner would wave triumphantly over his followers. He knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like his. So, what is the life of the trusting disciples going to be like? It's going to be like Christ-like. And here's what Christ's life was like. And here's what she says. A series of uninterrupted victories. Now, when we look at our life, is it a series of uninterrupted victories? Absolutely not. No. What she adds, not seen to be such here. Now, was Christ's life a series of uninterrupted victories from from appearances. No. Right. He was constantly confronted with apparent failure. So did he see his victory? No. But he could claim it by faith. And was it real? Did Christ actually, was he truly victorious? It wasn't some play acting, right? It's real. It was real, yes. It wasn't something that's just, you know, God makes it look like he was victorious. He had to be truly victorious. So if the life of his trusting disciples is to be like Christ's, it will not be seen to be as Christ's presently. But it is to be a series of uninterrupted victories will be recognized as such in the great hereafter. The closer we come to Christ, the more sinful, uh, more sinful we appear in our own eyes, not the less sinful. And we have this as an example of Christ. Some people have a hard time with the idea that Christ saw himself as a sinner, but knew by faith that he was the son of God. Um, there's a book called Confrontation. It's uh, a collection of some review and herald articles by Ellen White. And when you read through that, you can see quite clearly, especially in the temptation in the wilderness, which is primarily what it's addressing, that Christ didn't have any visible evidences in, um, in himself that he was the son of God. But he did have the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, in him I am well pleased. When he was baptized, and then he goes into the wilderness for 40 days. When Satan comes and says, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread, Christ then appeals to um, Moses' words where he says, I fed thee with manna for 40 years in the wilderness, that you may know that which you do not know in which your fathers did not know that man shall live by man shall not live by bread only but by every word of god so christ appeals to the words of moses to the words of faith that it's not the things that are seen the tangible things that we have as the evidences that god is working in our lives but it's through faith that we conquer So since he had no evidence to present that he was the son of God, he did have the voice of God 40 days before. And I think this is an important point in understanding um, righteousness by faith. And this is something we're going to look at in more detail in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy and in uh, the messages of Jones and Wagner. What kind of nature did Christ have? Now, we, we've talked about it in other studies in a bit here already, um, but when Jones and Wagner were giving their message um, in, from 1888 into the 90s, um, there was, 
this this misapprehension about what that message is about. That is, if we look at what people say about the 1888 message, um, it has actually been uh, history has been rewritten. Now there is a book um, by um, Daniels, A.G. A.D. A.G. A. Anyway, Daniels. What what's his initials? A.D. A.G. A.G. A.D. Daniels. What what's his name? <laughs> Does anybody know? I think it's Albert Grossenbenner. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the gross inventor, whatever that name is. That's why we just say he's A.G. Daniels. Okay. Anyway, he wrote this book on the righteousness of Christ. Now, if we read what Ellen White says to, to Daniels, and, and then we read his book, we can realize that what is happening is, um, if you read the book, most people would read it and just agree with it. They would say, well, this is what Jones and Wagner taught, because that's what we've been told Jones and Wagner taught. But if you actually read it carefully, you'll already see the seeds that are being planted that are going to manifest themselves a um, hundred years after 1888. And that's going to be uh, what happens when we see uh, the 1888 message study committee and when we're going to look at Jeff's um, response to uh, the book written by the guy name I can't remember, um, but we'll look at that. So, so there is this problem that within Adventism, when people talk about righteousness by faith, or they talk about the 1888 message, or the message of Jones and Wagner, or the Third Angel's message, however they're going to describe it, they actually have a false understanding of it. That is. There's been this uh, rewriting of the code, so to speak, in a computer program, that type of idea, where we are, are deceived to what's actually happening. And, and so many people are expressing uh, views that are totally antithetical to what Jones and Wagner taught, and yet claiming it is righteousness by faith. And so we're going to spend some time looking at that. And I think it's an important discussion. Um, one is, as we look at these things, we can see how Satan works um, in deceiving us, how he has deceived Adventists, and how many of us are still deceived and we still follow the same, we still got get caught in the same trap that Satan lays for us all the time. To understand what righteousness by faith is, is, I believe, the key to understanding prophecy. Now, why would I say that? Why is righteousness by faith the key to understanding prophecy? I'd never considered that before. Okay. The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Does that relate to understanding prophecy and to righteousness by faith? The interrelation is clear. Yeah. Yeah. So it now we could also say that prophecy is essential for us to um, experience righteousness by faith because prophecy reveals Christ. But the idea that we have been getting that I think is the hardest thing for Adventists to understand is that we are part of prophecy. That it's, it's being a part of prophecy that is the walk of righteousness by faith, especially for the final generation. That when we say righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, we're talking about prophecy where a people are going to be actively involved in that fulfillment of prophecy. That the third angel's message, when it comes, is not just a message that we give, but it's a message that we live to 
be a little bit cheesy. Right? It's not about understanding something correctly intellectually alone. It's about an experience. And that experience is not some emotional experience. It's some practical experience that occurs because of prophecy. So tying together the everlasting gospel being a three-step testing prophetic message is, is one of the keys to this movement, what this movement understands about righteousness by faith, what we understand about prophecy, what we understand about what we are passing through. Now, I like this part here. So the prince of the world is judged. Now shall he be cast out. With prophetic eye, Christ traced the scenes to take place in his last great conflict, right? So we can see all of these things that he's doing. And then she says Christ could do, uh, rejoiced that he could do more for his followers than they could ask or think. So again, Christ can do more for us. He's rejoicing that he can do more for us than we can ask or even think. Right, so he has all of this assurance based upon the promises in God's word. And that our lives can be like his, a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. Um, so to me, this is a very powerful statement. It places um, this work of judgment, the third step, as the end point, but we have to start with the first and the second step. That is, we have to have the first step, sin, the, th the second step, righteousness, in order to come to the third step, judgment. And Christ illustrates this in his life. He, he, he is constantly confronted with apparent failure, with sin, not, not that he's a sinner, but he feels as a sinner. He feels like a failure, that he hasn't done his mission. He has failed in his mission. Yet, he's not discouraged. He trusts in the promises in God's word, and that works out righteousness in him. But he knows that there's an end goal, and that end goal is judgment. And that's the casting out of Satan. Now, um, in what we read over the last uh, couple of weeks, we were going through these um, visions or um, writings of, in the spirit of prophecy of what she saw regarding uh, illustrations, she uses them as illustrations of the Advent, Advent movement. So I, I want to draw these out, and I want to address these this other scripture. So I just got to switch things here a bit. Switch to that camera, and I'll switch. Okay, so we should all see that. <clears throat> I mean, this is simple, but this was how, when I first came into the movement in 2010, this was something that the, the presenters were presenting. You have sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now we can see that he can convict the world or convince the world or reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. Now we would say that this is the first angel's message. This is the second, and this is the third. And we know that the first angel's message is going to be a message to who? The first angel's message should technically be to the world. 
Okay, but who's tested by it? Who's going to fail the test of the first angel's message? Those that refuse to give up their sin. Okay, so, but specifically in Millerite history? Protestants. Okay, so it's going to be the Protestants, right? So if we obviously expand it to different times, but we look at it as Protestants. Agreed. And the Protestants are in darkness, and we remember that when you have a line, uh, the increase of light that's going to come is in response to the specific darkness. Right, so you're going to have an increase of light, a formalization, and then you're going to have an empowerment, right, of a message. <clears throat> right. And, and, and we can see this line definitely in Millerite history. We're going to have the same thing with the second angel's message. But we know that in every line that we have ever studied, that when we get to the third angel's message, it arrives, but the work that is supposed to be accomplished is never truly completed. That is, we don't have an empowerment of the third angel's message. Um, now, sometimes we had thought that we had, but really when you look at it, there's always a falling away that occurs. That is, the work is never truly completed. And all of these reform lines that exist from the beginning um, are are basically building the body. If, if we want to look at it like, uh, again, the medical, you know, the, um, the books where they have the transparencies, anatomy uh, of a person, you build it step by step. And that's what God has been doing throughout history. He's been giving us light because men wrote, loved darkness rather than light because their sins are evil. So we know that man is in darkness. And this is what Ellen White is illustrating in these this darkness. Now, remember in the two different accounts, the one is from the perspective of earth and heaven is giving this light. And the other, it's the perspective from heaven looking down on earth. So it's more from the perspective of the angels in the one and heaven. And the other one's more from this perspective of what's seen on the earth. Though they are related. It's just, it's just the emphasis or focus of where uh, the story is being told. But, but we know that this refers to the individual's life as well. It's not just about what happened in Millerite history. And Parminder uh, came in and tried to destroy these lines in a very subtle way. And how did he specifically do that? Not everybody here understands that. Um, but how did Parminder do that? Uh, he did it in secret. Okay, well, yeah, but he did something here. This is 1989. Uh, this is 9-11. And this is Sunday Law. And what did he say 9-11 was? Baptism, right? Agreed. Okay. So this is baptism. And when we're baptized, we don't sin anymore. So by doing this, what he was doing was not just moving the waymarks, but obliterating them. Obliterating them. <laughs> okay. I shouldn't laugh at that. But yes, he's obliterating He's blotting out the meaning and significance of these lies, lines. Now, another way that we can do this, this is justification. This is sanctification. And this is glorification, though some people disagree with that and characterizing it this way. But this is where Christ's character is seen upon his people, right? Now, sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Now, when Christ sees himself with apparent failure, he's here, correct? 
I would agree. And then he claims the promises of God that, that righteousness is going to be worked out in spite of what he sees. And he sees the end result is Satan is going to be judged. He's going to be cast out. Now, this is all faith, right? Yes. None, none of this is seen. As you go through this journey, it's, it's a trust in God. Now, if we say baptism means that we're not sinning, because we know all of us have been baptized, at least maybe all of us, um, did we sin after we were baptized? Yes. Okay. So what does that mean? You're not converted. Well, so, and, and, and I, so if we're not converted, why are we baptized? Because baptism represents death to self and the walking of newness of life. But if we didn't walk in newness of life, then did our baptism count? Do we have to be rebaptized again? This distorts the understanding of righteousness by faith. Yes. Because we know that righteousness by faith is going from darkness to light. This is going from being a sinner to representing Christ's character perfectly. So where do we represent Christ's character perfectly in this line? There at the end. At the end, right? So but we do have righteousness. What's that? It's the seventh uh, or the third angel's message. Right. So, so we know that we have to represent Christ's character perfectly. And Christ isn't going to return until his character is perfectly reproduced in his people. That's what we understand. But we know, and, and, and see, this is where the distortion and the misunderstandings of rice, righteousness by faith happen. So you have some groups of people that say, you know, Christ puts his, his garment of perfect character over our filthy garment. And even though we're sinless, uh, God considers us to be, uh, or though we're sinful, God considers us to be sinless. So we're sinners, but we're, we're just covered over with Christ's righteousness. He does it all. We're always going to be sinners. We're never going to be changed in character. We might, we might be improved a little bit. You know, we might be a little bit nicer and so forth, but really we're just sinners and there's nothing we can do about it. That doesn't pan out. Right. But if that was the case, I wouldn't have become a Seventh-day Adventist because I wasn't concerned about getting saved. I was only concerned about changing. That is, I knew that I didn't want to be a sinner anymore. That is, I didn't want to do the things that I'm doing. And, and that is the work of salvation. Christ will save his people from their sins, not in their sins. So we know that Christ's righteousness does cover us. And this work of sanctification is a transformation that doesn't happen just in a moment. We don't just receive the gospel here and then live a perfect life. Now, to put baptism then, even though it symbolizes this righteousness, it symbolizes death to self and new life in Christ, it doesn't mean that baptism or sanctification is, is all that's needed, right? So we have, um, now justification, Ellen White says, is our, what, what's the something for, it's something, sanctification is something. I can't remember the words. What's our fitness for heaven? And often we focus on these two, justification and sanctification. One's our title to heaven, one's our fitness for heaven. Which one's the title for heaven?
I've heard the quote. I just don't remember it, what it is. Justification is our title to heaven and sanctification is our fitness for heaven. Now, when we look at this, then. Justification is this. So here I put it at the beginning, but isn't justification. This point or this period, I mean, and isn't sanctification. This. I mean, these are simplifications, but isn't there a process of sanctification that when it's completed results in glorification? And glorification is that we will get our new bodies, right? But glorification happens in a period. What happens at the close of probation? So we're going to put the close of probation there. So what does God do at the close of probation? What does he say about these people that have been going through this experience of the everlasting gospel? This is my, these are my children. Those are who I um, Some noise there. I'm not sure what that was. Okay, so the righteous are declared righteous. What does that mean? The righteous are declared righteous. Let the righteous be righteous still. Let the wicked be wicked still. What is God doing? What's happening at the close of probation? Separating the, the two classes. The two classes of people. Now, when now doesn't God declare us righteous when we first come to him? Doesn't isn't justification making us right with God? That we are, in a sense, declared righteous. So what's the difference here to here? Experience. Okay, there's definitely experience. So when we go to God and we are justified, our sins are forgiven in the sense that God is not going to, um, I don't even know how to put this. He's not, he's not going to count our sins to us. We're justified when we go to Christ. But now we have to walk and we know that we the, the work of sanctification is in a sense a, a daily justification right yes so so we're going through an experience we we came to christ he forgave our sins we feel at peace but as we walk we continue to see more and more how unchrist like we really are Right? He doesn't show us everything here because if we're in darkness and God gave us all of the light all at once, what would happen to us? Sure, well, one is we'd be blind, but we'd also be destroyed. Right? Yeah. We, there's no way that we could bear that. So we go through this walk with Christ that begins with justification and that we call sanctification. And it's the work of a lifetime. It's something that we are constantly doing. But we know that God has to have a people that are going to stand and reveal his character. And that's the 144,000, which I believe to be a literal number. And that is, that's the number that needs to be made up. Because God has declared this, in a sense, arbitrary number that are going to demonstrate that what Christ did in his life and in his death is real. And this they sometimes call last generation theology, and they use it as a derogatory term. But this is really what is taught in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. That for Christ to finish his work, he first needs to show not just to the righteous, but to the wicked as well. 
in a convincing manner that they will then accept the judgment that's being given to them. Now, if we are trying to say somewhere along the way in my Christian walk, I am perfect, what are we doing? So if I anywhere along this way, this, this line, I think I'm perfect, I haven't sinned, what are we doing? Deluding yourself. Okay, Dwight? Deluding yourself. Okay, you're deluding yourself, right? And isn't this what Parminder's movement did? Didn't they decide that the movement does not sin? Oh, yeah. And did they not really, did they actually really believe that they're righteous when in, in fact they're not? They so, bought into the lie. They bought into that lie. Now, is there anywhere along this line that we can then declare that we are righteous, that we can know we are righteous? No. And in fact, if I recall, uh, you do, the hundred, yeah, do the 144,000 see themselves as righteous? I would say no. No, right? Now, and this is amazing too, because their sins have been blotted out and they cannot bring them to remembrance, right? Right. But they see in their lives no good thing. They fear that there is something that they have done to disgrace Christ, some sin that is unforgiven. They are like Christ, because wasn't that Christ's experience? Yes. He didn't boast of his own righteousness. He says, the works that you see me do, they come from the Father. Because he was dependent upon his Father for everything, including righteousness. Everything that he had came from his Father, by faith, not by sight. And this is what we're going to see in, in, in this study of righteousness by faith. Because many people believe that they are righteous, that they're better than other people. They don't see their actual sin because they have deluded themselves. They have a false conception of righteousness by faith. And they think because they reject this idea that I'm going to keep sinning until Jesus comes back, right? because they reject that that false idea, the new theology, that what they have is better. But what they have is really just another species of the same uh, creature. Because both of them are based upon sight. Why do people think they're going to keep sinning until Jesus comes back? What is their common argument? What will they say to you when you say you believe in overcoming sin? Once saved, always saved. Okay. Well, what they, will they say to you? To, as an, We're only you. Okay. Well, they'll ask you a question, and they'll say, are you sinless? Right? Do you sin? Right. Okay. Because they're going to say, well, the reason I don't believe that we can overcome sin is because I'm a Christian and I've never been able to overcome sin. And so I don't believe it's possible. I believe Jesus is just going to save me. That's righteousness by faith. And if you finally just accept that Christ is going to save you and you don't need to overcome sin, then you're going to be free. Right? But that's a deception. But this is based upon sight, is it not? I see that I'm a sinner, so I must be a sinner, so I must not be able to overcome sin. Yes. But isn't it the same mistake to think I need to see myself as righteous in order to be righteous? Isn't that just righteousness by sight? Yes. Yeah, this was illustrated for me back in, uh, would have been 1987. I was at Light Bears camp meeting in Washington, and um, there was a guy there who's now a pastor, um, but at the time he was just a young man because this was a long time ago, of course, right? Um, but he believed he was, his group was called Life Supports. So I'm not sure how they ended up with that name. Uh, but he believed that he hadn't been sinning since, I think, March or something like that, and this is in the early summer, maybe June or July. And... Um, he was there to teach something about, I think, herbs or wilderness survival or something. 
uh, but he was told he wasn't to talk about his beliefs. And um, of course, everybody knew about this. So at his campsite, there's all kinds of people gathered around wanting to hear what he had to say. And he was talking about his experience, how he, he just believed the word of God. And now he was without sin and that we just need to believe the word of God, which of course, this would be presumption, right? That's not faith. And that was interesting when I was at that camp meeting. Um, I was the most righteous I have ever been in my entire life by appearances. And what Satan had done is he just drew back all of the temptations that he'd given me before. And he just made it look like I was just acting so Christ-like. But I knew, based upon my reading of the Spirit of Prophecy and Jones and Wagner, that that was a deception. That if I saw myself as righteous, that is actually not righteousness by faith. It's simply righteousness by sight. And so I knew it was a deception to try to get me to side with uh, this, this other guy. And so that to me was a lesson that I learned about righteousness by faith. And that our focus is not to look at ourselves to see that we've overcome sin so we can now have confidence that Christ is working in our lives. But our righteousness is in Christ. We look to him. If we look at ourselves, we should just see ourselves as sinners. That doesn't mean you excuse, you know, overt sin as, well, you know, I just see myself as a sinner. So obviously I can keep, keep doing that. We're going to see ourselves as sinners and have the conviction of sin and continue to seek to overcome in every area of our lives. But we're not going to see ourselves as victorious. We're going to have to trust this work of salvation, this everlasting gospel. Now, remember, the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message. So one of the things that we have learned in our morning studies is that this is not just some theory that we study about, but it's something we have to experience, and we experience it through prophecy itself. That is, this movement has to go through this three-step testing prophetic message. I mean, it, it should be understood because that's what Jeff has been teaching, but we sort of still see ourselves as distances, distance from it. We see this as way marks on a line somewhere in the future without recognizing that we are actually going through this. So this is the process of salvation for the individual, but it's also what we have to go through as a movement. And there isn't really a separation from that. Now there was this problem when when Parminder first mentioned this, and they would use this this um, explanation when people would be talking about, well, you know, I'm I still am am sinning, right? And and it's since 9/11. I mean, I came into the movement after 9/11, right? So the argument was, well, you know, this is for the line is for the movement. And, but as an individual, you maybe aren't at 9-11 yet, right? That, something to that effect. But when we understand that, that this is the individual and the line are connected, that, and that when we come to each of these waymarks, each of these waymarks illustrates, again, a three-step testing prophetic message. As light comes to us, we have to go through this process so you can take this and put it on each of these way marks that there is this three-step testing prophetic message so i know that's it's not directly you know related to i mean we're looking at the lines here but you can see how um when we're looking at righteousness by faith, we're looking at prophecy. Any any comments on this?
you're just giving some very good points for consideration of the things that have really been obfuscated by the church over the last hundred odd years. Yeah, and that's what we want to understand. We want to understand how the rejection of the first and second angel's messages and the third angel's message, how they're all related to a rejection of righteousness by faith, but an, um, an obscuring of that teaching so that Adventists are completely in confusion regarding it. And, and there would be no need. I mean, one of the things was we had the 1888 message study committee. And um, Jack Sakira, that's the guy's name, he, he was, uh, I guess, a neighbor of uh, Robert Wheeland, right? And, and a convert of his. I, I, think that's, I, I think he was a convert. I don't know about the neighbor. Okay. He was a convert anyway of Robert Wheeland. And Robert Wheeland was, uh, they, and, and um, Robert Wheeland and um, uh, Don, Donald, uh, what's his name? Donald Short. Donald, yeah, Donald K. Short, right? The missionaries to um, Africa. Africa, which is a pretty big place. So I'm not sure specifically where in Africa. Um, but they were on this this minority committee. So when the, the church was examining the 1888 message study, or the 1888 message, they had this 1888 message study committee. And Donald Ashort, Don Short, and Robert Wheeland were on the minority. So they presented a minority report. Basically, they disagreed with the decisions because the church had taken the position that we accepted the message of Jones and Wagner. But Whelan and Short said, no, we didn't. It's surprising, too, because in 1952, the church was pressing and pressing very hard that they had accepted everything about the message of righteousness by faith. Mm -hmm. And this is what led to the, the, the books that were written by um, Morris Venden, because he, he was more in keeping with what he saw the message to be. Mm -hmm. Yes. So... And, and, and it was it would have been a very confusing time for Seventh-day Adventists because they're trying to sort out this message of righteousness by faith. But because they have rejected the prophetic message, they don't have the key that's going to bring them through the experience of righteousness by faith. And, and in my, my, my experience as a Seventh-day Adventist, so... You know, I'm, I've always been, from very early on in my Christian experience, a belief in overcoming sin, Christ's sinful human, na <coughs> human nature, <coughs> and um, the message of Jones and Wagner. And, and that's mostly what I preached on through all the years before I came into this movement in 2010. So for, you know, 30, 30 years, I was preaching the message of Jones and Wagner, reading all their material, reading the 188 message study committee material, reject, rejecting where they went astray, because they did go astray. Uh, read M. L. Andreasen's material, read the 1888 materials that the conference put out, 1888 materials of Ellen White, and also all the other materials, the different letters. There was a book, paperback one, and then four sort of reddish brown Ellen White ones and um, you know studying all this preaching on it but the one thing I did not understand was the prophetic message so what I had was this belief in overcoming sin and that you know one day we're going to overcome sin and we will you know represent Christ we will have his character and this had something to do with the close of probation so the probation was going to close and I knew about the loud cry, knew about the Sunday law. But 
I didn't know about the first and second angel's messages. So I was focused on the third angel's message. And, and you can't have a third without the first and the second, as we know. Now, to understand this, I mean, this is going to take some time, I think, because we can sort of kind of see it. We know that prophecy is important. Now, why is prophecy important? Why did Jesus tell us things before they came to pass? Why does he have prophecy? Why is the Bible a prophetic book? To build our faith. Yeah, it's about faith. I've told you things before they come to pass. When they come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Right? Correct. Right. I'm not sure if that's word for word what the verse says. That's a good um, paraphrase, though. Yeah. So Christ tells us what's going to come to pass because we need to understand who Christ is. And Ellen White says we need to see him in types and symbols. Now, when we talk about having a relationship with Christ, for many Adventists, this is some kind of meditative sort of, you know, you spend time praying, you think about Christ, you can imagine the person of Christ. But aren't we sort of, in, in the way that many people do it, aren't we making God into our own image? Aren't we just pretending to have, isn't Jesus kind of like an imaginary friend? For many people? I would have to say yes. Yeah, I mean, it's for, for too many. Yeah. Um, he's the magical sky fairy, right? He's somebody they go to. And, and we see this in the Christian world. That is, there's this belief in Christ, but they don't act as if Christ really exists. And this is what often people criticize about Christianity. And this, of course, exists everywhere. People have these ideas or conception of who Christ is. And so they can imagine they're having a relationship with Christ. But because they don't understand prophecy, they're like those that have rejected the second angel's message. When Christ moves from the holy to the most holy place, Satan is there. And he has much light and power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. They have not experienced a true relationship with God. Now, I'm not trying to judge other people's experiences because God works with what people know and understand. But as people walk with God and obey him, he's going to continue to lead them into all truth. So we can see that prophecy is a way for us to actually understand who Christ is. Now, one of the things that I'm amazed about as I've been in this movement, but especially the last couple of years in our regular study, in digging into the scriptures in the way that we have, is to see in the scriptures the continual illustration of the everlasting gospel in a way that is real, it's prophetic. We are, we are seeing, as we're reading all of these stories, we're seeing our present experience, correct? We're not just reading about the past, what happened in the past and understanding the past. And we're not just looking at the Bible as some prophecies about what's going to happen in the future. You're living out the experience. Yeah. As we're reading the Bible, we're seeing what we are experiencing. Yeah, especially in these, the daily studies. Yeah. It's been really apparent. Yeah. And and this to me is amazing in my experience. <laughs> because one is, it has taken my eyes off of the things of the world and placed them upon Christ. This message has done that. So even though I used to be a belief in overcoming sin, definitely I would be one of those who was not acting as if I believed in overcoming sin. That is, my life was not, um, I wasn't growing spiritually. I wasn't understanding that what we're, what we're being shown now, that living connection 
prophetically. Now, some people could just, you know, uh, say that this is some kind of a delusion that we have as a movement. But we've seen the objective evidences in unmistakable ways. And this takes us, this brings a strong conviction, I believe, to each of us that lifts us above this world and allows us to trust in God in a way that we can't. And all of us are facing trials in various ways. Um, you know, I'm going through a major trial right now with, you know, with work. Um, you know, to see all these years of work just being dismantled before my eyes, it, it's pretty frightening. And I'm being, I'm having to trust that God is going to, to take care of me. And I know other people have had these same experiences. But I'm encouraged because we're studying something that is illustrating what we're going through. We're part of a prophetic movement. So this sin, righteousness, and judgment, this work of salvation, this three-step testing prophetic message, this justification, sanctification, and judgment or glorification, however we want to look at it, this is something that is the everlasting gospel. And, and when, when we look at this, as we go through these studies, as we look historically what happened in Adventism, how this, why this truth was rejected by the Adventist church in 1888, and why it still continues to be rejected, even though it's given lip service, it's been rewritten. It's been, the words have been redefined so that we can make it look like we're believing in something that we're not. But the question is, are we doing that? Are we really studying to see ourselves as sinners? And are we willing to accept that God is going to finish this work that he has begun in us? Now, often what happens in the Christian life is a person comes to believe in God and they may experience some forgiveness, but they start to compare themselves with others and they can start, start to consider that they are better than others. They become Pharisees. And, and those can happen on both sides of, of the religious spectrum. You could be a liberal and think you're better than others and you can be a conservative, you know, Adventist, and think you're better than others. But we compare ourselves with others, and we think that that's satisfactory. But we are to compare ourselves to Christ. We have to know Christ. He, he's revealed in prophecy. And so when we can fool ourselves that we are righteous because we do certain things that are acceptable to our nature and of course we ignore the things that are not we turn a blind eye to the things about ourselves that we can't control and often those are, are things like gossip and and judging other people and pride and all these things that we just hide but we can we can say that we eat properly or we dress properly or we have the right views on certain things and that makes us righteous. Yet we know that righteousness comes from God alone. Now, getting back to the idea that 9-11 is baptism, what does that mean about 9-11? Because it is baptism. What is 9-11 in, in the context of the everlasting gospel. What does it illustrate and why? The second angel message. Okay, it's the second angel's message. And how does it illustrate that? I mean, planes crashing into the World Trade Center.
Okay, you can't have a second without a first, right? Right. So, so it illustrates it prophetically. So 1989, now I know not everybody was in this message in 1989, but a lot of us are older. And in 1989, when the wall, the Berlin Wall fell, and that period of 777 days then to the fall of the Soviet Union, was it a prophetic event? Well, yes. Yeah, okay. Daniel, uh, Daniel Levin. Right. And so we say that they're, 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 it's, it's the time of the end. And that means we had a period of darkness prior to that. And so now we have this event happen. And now many of us didn't live through it, but some of us did. And some of us were Adventists at that time. At least I was. And so when that event happened, I knew it was a fulfillment of prophecy. But the church wasn't interested in it. I mean, all the church thought about the fall of the Soviet Union was now we can go to the Soviet Union and do evangelistic work, right? Yeah. So the church was just interested in evangelistic work. They didn't see it as a prophetic waymark, even though we had Louis F. Weir's books that were telling us what was going to happen with the United States and the papacy working together to overthrow the Soviet Union, and it happened. And yet the church wasn't interested. They ignored him, yeah. like others. Yeah. So it it becomes a prophetic message that should be an increase of light. Did an increase of light come from what happened with the fall of the Soviet Union? We would say yes. And it came to us, some of us, individually. So, I mean, obviously not everybody lived through it. But, but to Jeff who's the, the one that was picked, the prophet who was picked at that time to give that message, it meant something to him. And he begins studying and seeing line upon line. So in the individual life, there is some event that happens that is analogous to the fall of the Soviet Union. It's going to bring us light, an increase of light. And that's going to be different for all kinds of people, whatever that event is. But to become converted means that you have to come to that. You have to be in a period of darkness, and you need to see light. For me, it personally happened in 1980, August 11th. That's when I saw that I was in darkness and that I needed light. So then we respond to this, this light. So now we move along, and we've seen this illustrated in Ellen White's um, illustrations of, of the Millerite movement. So we have light, but we're bound, right, into groups in one of the illustrations. And so we need to be freed. And so we keep responding to this light. So when we get to that second way mark, and we know that there's, of course, the formalization, the empowerment. We're not going to go through that, but we, we know that happens. She illustrates those. When we come to the second, this is, we're saying it's the, the second step is sanctification, and that's being marked by 9-11. So it's another event. It's another prophetic event, Right. We had the first one, November 9th, 1989. It's a prophetic event. It illustrates a reform line, the time of the end. And we have this increase of light. So we see Jeff with this increase of light. When he gets to 9-11, we have another event, and it's also going to be an increase of light, right? I mean, there's an increase of light all the way. But that one becomes... And when we studied the history of this movement, the foundation, the exam, the foundation, what did 9-11 do that 9, 1989 did not do? Well, let's put it that way. I recognize the seventh trumpet, of course. Okay, okay. what about um, the separation? Now, before 
9-11. Was Jeff at all um, thinking about separation from the Adventist church in any way? No, he wasn't no. thinking about that. He's no. an Ad We're all just Adventists, right? Yeah. You know, there's apostasy in the church. There's all kind of wrong ideas, but he's a Seventh-day Adventist. But 9-11 is going to cause a separation. That is, he's going to recognize that a door was closed to Adventism. After 9-11, it takes a little bit of time, but Jeff is now no longer interested in talking to the theologians or to the church. He was before, right? He was actually involved in that discussion with, with these people. Now, you know, that happened after 9-11, I believe, too. But um, as time moved on, he saw more and more that the church had been passed by and that, just like with the Millerites, a group of people had been separated out. Now, on the individual level, what does that mean? What, is, what do the Protestants represent on our personal line? What are they symbolic of? What is it that we're separating from as we come to sanctification? Well, you got the Levites. Okay, I'm talking about on a personal, personal level. What, personal, what's yeah. in our personal line of justification, sanctification, and glorification of sin, righteousness, and judgment? Strange wives. You got to get rid of the strange wives. Okay, so so when we first come come to Christ, we see that we're a sinner, right? And we're justified. But as we continue to walk with Christ, we see a greater need for sanctification. That is, when we first come to Christ and Christ forgives us for our sins, you know, we, we, can, we can feel that forgiveness. We can feel that peace. But as we continue our walk, we're not satisfied with that experience we have to move on to something else. And that experience is going to put us at odds with the world in a way that we never imagined. The work of the second angel, the work of sanctification, I believe that many Adventists have never experienced it, that they have only just experienced justification on a very limited sense and never have moved to the second step of sanctification. That is, we talk about it, Sanctification is the work of the lifetime, but we actually do nothing about it. Sanctification is a separation from the world on an individual level. That is, our hopes and our dreams and our ambitions are no longer tied up with the world. Do people agree or disagree with me on that one? Good. Agreed. Yeah. Because many people will accept that Jesus forgave me for, for my sins, but they're not going to move beyond that. And, and in a sense, they end up rejecting the first angel's message. Because when the light of the second angel comes to them, and God is asking something more of them, they're not willing to do it. And I think that many Christians, many Adventists, have never passed beyond justification for their sins. That Christ has justified them. They may experience that forgiveness, but they fall away. And so when this other deeper understanding of truth comes to them, deeper experience, they reject it as fanaticism. And they mock those who experience it. And you start to find yourself separated from that group of people, even though they were your friends. Have we experienced this? Yeah. Okay. So 9-11 represents that. Literally for the church, the church closes its doors to the second angel's message. It's already rejected the first. So 9-11 is not a prophetic marker for the Adventist church. But it is 
we know because it's a rejection of the second angel's message. It's a rejection of, of prophecy. But this movement accepted 9-11. And we understand its prophetic significance. It represents baptism. And many of us have been baptized. That is, we, were, we saw ourselves as sinners. And we got baptized. But we never accepted what that means. Because baptism is a step in conversion where the old man dies. And we and the new man lives. And Paul says, I die daily. Right? We just don't die once. He knows he has a sinful human nature. That if he were to follow his nature, he would do the things that he doesn't want to do. So he depends upon Christ in a way. That is sanctification. Sanctification is being made righteous. Justification is being declared righteous. But we know the third angel's message, which we drew up there, is also a declaration of righteousness. So why is why does God, when probation close, why is he declaring he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is wicked, let him be wicked still. What is it about the third step? And we're, we're going to look at this in a lot more detail as we go through. But what is it about the third step that's different than the first and the second step? I think everybody's settled, settled into what they want to do. Right. So God did yeah. need to declare us righteous, even though we're not righteous when we're justified, but he's going to now declare us righteous on the third step because we are righteous, not righteous in and of ourselves, but we reflect Christ's character. We have learned not to trust in self, not to trust in the things that are seen. We're not looking to ourselves for righteous righteousness. The 144,000 do not believe that righteousness comes from humanity from within themselves. They don't believe they are righteous based upon what they see. They trust that God is going to accomplish the work in them and they don't look to themselves for righteousness. So there is a declaration that we are righteous because we are now righteous. Now that could be misunderstood because sometimes people think, well, that means you're like, you have these criticisms, your little Christ, or you somehow have received holy flesh. Now, the 144,000, can they still say with Paul, I know that in me, that is my, in my flesh dwells no good thing? Can the 144,000 say that? Can yeah, they or do they? Will they? Yeah. Well, I see them saying that right to the end. Right. So they're going to know. That, and I believe, so there's, there's a, and we're going to look at this, but if you look at Romans chapter 7 and 8, and you read these, um, this is going to talk about baptism um, and what sin is. Well, actually, starting in, actually on chapter 6, it's going to start with baptism. It's going to use uh, an illustration of uh, what has, who has to die. And then, um, and then it's going to say here, um, what shall I, we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. And we're going we're gonna to go through this. I don't really want to go uh, through it now. But in here, he says, the law is spiritual, and I am carnal, sold under sin. Now, we are in the flesh, right, literally. When we are converted, we don't get holy flesh. We don't get some new body so that we can't sin. Get the Holy Spirit, not holy flesh. <laughs> right. We actually have a new mind.
Um, so Paul says in Romans 7, 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Now Parminder worked really hard to obscure this truth. He did a study on the nature of man in 2017. And in that study on the nature of man, what he was trying to do was undermine this verse. Wasn't well, there something in the baptismal vows that he that he put in there that? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what it was exactly what it was. Yeah, so um, yeah, we're going to look at the baptismal vows. Um, we're going to get to that. Okay, all right. Um, but basically, he denied that Jesus had a sinful human nature; that he just had a sinful uh, body. Uh, okay, yeah, I didn't read it carefully. Carefully yeah. enough when I was baptized. <laughs> yeah, I actually pointed it out, and I told Parminder he needed to correct it. Uh, and, um, and I and I showed him all the scriptures of why that that statement was incorrect. That Christ had the sure. same nature, not a body, but uh, he didn't correct it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he knew what he was doing. Um, it was a way for people to see themselves as righteous. Um, there's a lot more to it there. But when we look at this, all of this is true of Christ. Because did Christ has a, have a sinful human nature? Could he say, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing? Yes, he could say that. And he could say, of the flesh, to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. That is, the flesh can decide to do something, but it doesn't have the power to do it. Because he's talking about the flesh here. He's not talking about the mind. When he talks about the mind, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could it not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So when he talks about me, you know, he says it in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. He's talking about his flesh, his human nature. But here he says that we have something of the spirit. That is, we need the spirit of Christ. For to be carnally minded, that is fleshly minded, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, that is the mind of the flesh, that is the flesh that can will to do God, God's will but won't do it, is enmity against God, right? For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So we're going we're to look at this in more detail and give it more context. But these are things that we can read in the scriptures. And often what has happened is people have, have taken Romans chapter 7 and said, this is Paul before he was converted. But there's no reason to take that position. It, and, and what's happened is we've been given this false dichotomy on how we look at this scripture. Paul is talking about the flesh, what the flesh, flesh does. The flesh sins. Without the spirit of Christ, without the mind of Christ, right? you have to let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. right? If we don't have the mind of Christ, we can't we cannot overcome sin. And we need to understand what that means. Because a lot of these things are sort of ideas. But we know that prophetically, we can come to understand these things. And, and I think it's interesting that Romans 7, 18, that's July 18th. 
Why would this verse illustrate July 18th? For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. But the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. I think uh, July 18th uh, revealed a lot about ourselves. Ah, exactly. I think July 18th helped us to realize, if we understood it correctly prophetically, if we, under, we put it in its proper place, that we are not prepared for what the attack on Nashville would have meant to us that we 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 do not we we haven't really understood this and that this message of July 18th is to illustrate for us this truth so that we can know it because this is exactly what the 144,000 have that allows them not to trust in the flesh they have the knowledge of what the flesh is they know what they are apart from Christ. And so they don't do anything apart from Christ. They don't look to themselves for righteousness. They don't say, well, I know in me that is in my flesh. Now that I'm converted, you know, I'm good. They know that they have a sinful human nature. They know apart from Christ, they can do nothing. Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. But he also knew that he could do nothing without his father. And so prophecy brings us to, through these experiences. So um, we will look next week. We will go through um, the statements that uh, Leona put together, that she presented. But we're going to look at them in the context of what we've been studying and see how they're relevant I mean, they're very powerful statements in that paper. So I, I will send it out to everyone to make sure everyone has it. And um, if anybody's watching and they want me to send it to them, just uh, uh, you can always email me, Theodore James Turner at gmail.com, and I can send out any papers you want. Okay, so any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the study this evening and for the Sabbath. We ask for your presence in our lives. We know, Lord, that we fall far short of your glory. Help us to trust in you, to walk by faith and not by sight. Help us to trust in what Christ has done for us, what he wants to do in us and that what he wants to do through us. Be with us now on the Sabbath and in our study tomorrow morning. Help us, Lord, to understand your truth and to share it with others is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.